Nick's legacy on the golf course is shown by his results. He's won six majors. He's won 30 times on the European Tour. He's played in 11 consecutive Ryder Cups. He's a member of World Golf Hall of Fame. That's, that's his legacy. His legacy on course is right there to see with the statistics. Anytime you saw that Nick Faldo was on a leaderboard, even just at your tournament, it felt like it had stature. I was really immediately intrigued by Nick Faldo because he was not somebody that you necessarily wanted to get paired with. You know, he, it wasn't like fun. It was, uh, he, he was a guy that you wanted to watch, but there would be no conversation. Uh, maybe he modeled himself more Hogan-esque. Nick was Nick on the course. Nick was, uh, he was uh, determined, conscientious, hardworking, um, competitive, of course. I think his drive, my guess from knowing him, would be that it comes from, your, I believe you're born who you are. I think he came from his parents and became this competitive child and liked to be exact about things. And then he found this sport. He, he was always an athlete as a child and found this sport and took to it and then wanted to master it. I played my first round of golf on my 14th birthday, July the 18th. Mum and Dad bought me a half set of clubs, of course, St Andrews, and a little bag, what have you. And off I went and I played. So the cool thing was I've been hitting golf balls for about three months or so, since April. So at least I could hit it. I got past shanking, topping it, missing it. And so I could actually hit it. So I went and played on my own, very first time at Welling Garden, on my birthday. So very early, 73, just after I've left school, dad takes me to Troon. I sat on the practice ground and I watched the guys. So I'm watching Jack and Arnold and Gary and Lee and Johnny Miller and Weisskopf were battling. So those, and so I soaked it all up, all their little idiosyncrasies and all the different styles and everything. And so that again was another Unbelievable thing in my career. Hey, I've, had, I've got that ability to do that. So when I come back to Welling Garden, you know, I practice all morning and I go and play. And the other thing it, that it did for me, which unbeknown then, but you, under, you get it now, if I'm hitting a shot and I'm Jack Nicklaus, it's, I'm going in with the intentions of it obviously being a great shot. Jack's hitting a three, went into 10. Of course he's going to knock it on the green. Whether it went there or not, I can't remember. You know, probably didn't. But I am somebody else, so I've given me the belief that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. So all I can really remember is, you know, by 15, I've made the decision, that's it, I want to be a pro golfer. 16, I leave school. I mean, it was the only way to do it. You know, there's no, there's no um, um, scholarships or anything like that. So that was really it. So I then left school, headed straight to the practice ground, and you know, it's not like mum and dad had to check on me. I went there, that was it, that was, that was my world, I loved it. My first goal after deciding I wanted to be a pro was, then it was the British tour, and we had a top 60. So first goal was getting the top 60. So my very first year I scraped it, finished 58th. So that's pretty amazing when you think of it. So from taking up golf, being inspired by Jack, I'm now playing against him six and a bit years later. And I never forget, I'm going, and I was long then. I had a, I had a Aldilla shaft, you know, that started to invent graphite. And I could hit this thing out there. And I hit it about 20 yards past Jack up the fourth hole. And I walked up there and I could, you know, I knew he was looking at me. I could, I could feel it, I could feel it in my back of my neck. <laughs> and they had big red sweaters on as well. And I'm like, don't look back, don't look back. He's looking at me. So anyway, we beat them two and one, so that was amazing. And the next day I played Watson, who was the Open champion. I beat him one up. So how about that? So here I am, this young 20-year-old. So I'm the youngest Ryder Cup player ever at that time. And I've just beaten those two guys. And so 78 at St Andrews, I finished four shots back to Jack. That was my first feeling of pressure, and I coped. And I, and I know I left St. Andrews and I said, right, one day I'll, I will win the Open, 1978. I said that to myself.
So I made a decision to, for the rebuild, end of 84. So even though I was European number one in 83, I won five times that year. And I actually won in 84 in America, but I blew up the Open in 83. I was leading at Birkdale with nine to play and blew up. And so, yeah, I'm basically saying I'm not good enough at the majors. Like anybody, I would have been a naysayer at, at somebody that had played Ryder Cup, had won championships around the world, to all of a sudden say, this isn't good enough. Um, and I think the personalities of Ledbetter and Faldo meshed perfectly. You know, David was a analytical player turned coach that had had success with Nick Price, who was an opposite sort of player. He was more feel oriented, much quicker rhythm and tempo. I was down in South Africa and David Ledbetter was there and I've been talking to a couple of us and I chatted to him about his thoughts on my swing and he was the, kind of the first one who then said, yeah, if, we, if you do this, this and this, or this, it should take care of this, this and this. Well, it's very interesting looking at Sir Nick's old swing, which was very good. He had his hands much higher. He had it sit down into the ground, which is kind of the modern golf swing. But he felt like it wasn't consistent enough. I had a lot of drag or lag going back with the arms. And back in the 70s, it was really, you know, all about legs. We had the famous reverse C look, but the body went right around. So he used to get at the top and say legs, and the legs were around here, and then the body caught up like this, and a big high finish. So the golf ball used to fly, literally, well, especially old equipment, it always went low to high. You know, it was a, you know, a, ma a major risk at that time to make that change, but he felt that that's what was required. He had a lot of trust in David Ledbetter. He had somebody that believed in what he was trying to do. And he had a real down time when a lot of people would have thrown in the towel and gone back to their old swing. But he was completely committed to doing this change and he did it. So I absolutely just plummeted. You know, I'm trying to go and play with all these different swing thoughts and everything. And you know, my game's going down, everything, I'm losing sponsors. So I call it the dark days, it was brutal. And they were pretty drastic changes for an elite player. Uh, Faldo seemed to, he like hummed a lot the changes. It was almost like he was trying to use a rhythm from his own body. Um, and a lot of players talked about listening to music while they played. Sam Snead liked uh, whistling like a waltz, but Faldo hummed, he made these peculiar noises and that helped him to get some rhythm and flow, and especially in his backswing, where he really tried this concept of turning, folding, and setting the club. And he did it to his own music, his own noises. The new swing that Sir Nick developed was a much more rounded golf swing. His arms didn't go up as much. It was more rounded. He had more lateral slide in his golf swing. Um, it gave him a nice trajectory that he controlled the golf ball. Uh, before he could hit the ball really high and lose it uh, both ways, this gave him a very consistent shot pattern. It was a, a golf swing that he could control the golf ball. 87, I, I wasn't in the Masters, so that was tough as well because I was flying through Atlanta and you know all the media were going off to Augusta and I went to Hattiesburg and played uh, you know, the B-Tour event there but we'd been practicing hard and something had clicked and we thought, wow, I've now got the fade going. I felt more confident. And I shot 467s and finished second and that was it. That was like, wow, I've got it now. And so I went to Muirfield and um, I was messing around with partners on Wednesday afternoon and famously walked past the big yellow scoreboard. We, we just said, welcome to Muirfield. May not even said that then but there's a blank leaderboard and I saw my name at the top. I went, that's all right, I can handle that, and just kept walking. And off I went. Played good, had rough weather, played with Ray Floyd uh, first couple of days. And so then I'm in uh, tied with Zinger, I think, you know, Paul Azinger, going into Sunday. And, um, and again, the weather changed and it was now pea soup. Absolute, the golf ball was going nowhere. Now the famous 18 pars. Well, one great shot's gonna win me and one bad shot's gonna cost you it. So yes, that's the knife edge that you're playing. 
through the whole day. And I made a couple of good scrambles, a couple of great bunker shots. Come down the last, and I just said, well, if you want to win, you've got to hold it. It was as simple as that. So I did, I popped it in. And then I had to wait, just one more group. Paul Azinger was behind me, came up the last, needing a four to tie, and then he knocks it in the bunk and takes five, and that was it. And, I, and, then it, and it was funny, then it was just relief. It was just like, I've done it. That was been my goal since 78. It's now 87. I finally won the Open, that was it. The next month before that Masters, I was winding myself up. I was, I was practicing at Wentworth here in England. And I, I'm like, you're like, you're trying to defend, you're trying to defend it. And I thought, oh, no, I can stop that. Just trick yourself, just, just go and win another one. Let's start again, forget that one. Let's go and win another one. So that was, that was good. To win again was amazing. I mean, it, so I became only the second to Jack. And it was really special. I'd done something historic to defend, and then nobody will ever, ever do that again. I don't know where I got that mental strength from. I really don't. When you know it's 30 years ago, but when you're right in it, it's that's the way I wanted to play golf. And I, I had that mental strength to, you know, to be able to focus and be completely engrossed. And I've obviously hit millions of golf balls to give me the skill to, to do it. You know, do it again when I need it. He was incredibly influential in the success that not only we had at the Ryder Cup back then, but since. We've won nine of the last 13 Ryder Cups, and he has been part of the inspiration for the young players. Uh, next year, 77, is now Ryder Cup year, and I'm thinking, well, okay, I'd like to make the Ryder Cup team. That's why I didn't play the Walker Cup, because I wanted to, you know, play and make the Ryder Cup. So, and I, and I did. Obviously, I finished eighth in the order of merit, winning like nearly 9,000 pounds, <laughs> and had the most incredible Ryder Cup. But we're on Jack's course. Bottom line, we outplayed America tee to green. We outputted America on greens that wouldn't, Pretty close to 15 on the stem, unbelievable. And I had a great one with, I had a new partnership with uh, Ian Woosnam. So we had a great time together and we did our bit, we contributed our bit. And so we won, so it was a, probably one of the, obviously one of the best weeks in my life that to be part of that transition, first, first ones to ever win in America. So that was really, really special. And that was really what, turned the whole Ryder Cup round. Then from then on, you know, Europe has been the formidable force. How do you beat us? Even if we are, you know, Kate, or definitely on sometimes, on paper, got the, uh, the weaker team. Every great player I've had the luxury of playing alongside by Steris, Nicholas's, the Tom Watsons, the quest was never to be liked. They realized there was a small window and they had to maximise it, and if they didn't, they would never, ever achieve what they wanted to achieve. Nick was tough, didn't say much, uh, similar to a Ben Hogan sort of character, but away from the course, uh, far different person. The media made a conscious effort, I feel, to make me look bad. There's two stories, always, isn't there, everything. You make somebody look good or make somebody look bad. I really feel they wanted to make me look bad more than that. It's a very slow game. It's an incredibly selfish game. So it's logical in a way that you have to have that level of um, solitude and, and selfishness, put whatever word you want to use. If you ever got Nick Faldo as a pairing, you're like, well, this isn't going to be fun tomorrow as far as I'm not going to talk about our wives, our children, or our sports, but I got to watch one of the best players in the world play. And I loved doing that, you know, as a, as a competitor myself playing against the best in the world was always stimulating, interesting. But again, in, in Nick's case, it wasn't like, oh God, this is gonna be fun. Misconception is that he's unfriendly. Um, some people will take that from a moment of seeing him or passing by. And I would say it's more of a shyness initially that um, a lot of people have when you first meet them. And my friend Shell said to me, oh, Ike, if you've got that mental strength, I could have taught you 
to bounce out and react more with the crowd, be a bit more fun and friendly. And then when you come back to the bag, you put your hand on the driver and, and click back into golf mode. And I'm like, well, that would have been a big help, wouldn't it? They would have, you know, people would have, would have thought a bit more of me or whatever. I don't know. You get um, brought in a knighthood for services to golf, and then, then it all happens, off you go into the room, and you're told, you know, you face Her Majesty gentlemen, that bow ladies curtsy, walk forward, take a knee. So the real funny bit for me <laughs> was you, I do that, take the knee, and Her Majesty's miles away, like, like this, at least six feet from you, and you're sitting and you're kneeling, and this sword goes, woof, and it comes at you. Let me think, so I thought, that's the real funny bit to me. I got this four foot sword coming at you. So I got a big grin on my face when I saw this thing coming at me. So, so that was really it. So it was, it was a really, as you can tell, it was an amazing, amazing emotional day, ridiculous. My agent calls me and he says, how would you like to be in the tower with Jim Nance? I said, you're kidding me. And that was on the Monday and by Friday, I'm in New York with a sign to sign a contract and boom. So it was like instant. The surprising thing about Nick going and broadcasting is most people, number one, would think it wasn't gonna last very long and he wasn't gonna be very good. But I think that's the alter ego. The, deep down, there was, there was the person that wanted to be like, but couldn't afford to be because golf was the priority. So really, I think broadcasting in a, in a weird way, it's just my opinion, was a way for him to almost exercise that part of his personality. You can hear it in him. He literally wants to um, create the link with the audience. Well, the real Nick is the guy that you hear on the air. Uh, he didn't show us that side uh, of his personality when he was a player. He is a big part of the team and he allows the rest of us to flourish as well. It's not default to Nick all the time like it is on the other networks, default to the analyst. We are all a team and we're all an equal part of that team. And I think Jim and Nick are, are a wonderful pair and uh, it's, it's been a good team for 16 years. It goes straight to CBS with Nance, 18th Tower, was the job. Jim, Jim is the best. And um, so I thought, wow, with me next to him, I thought, yeah, we would be we're the best team out there. Now when I hear him talk about situations that are challenging and intense and at a critical moment at a tournament, and I hear his nervousness, I wonder how did he block out that voice when he was a player? I mean, it takes tremendous uh, mental capacity and strength of mind to be able to not hear that little voice doubting you inside your head. I want to leave my name. I mean, I want to leave it as a golfer. Crumbs, I, what I did on the golf course is pretty good. I, it was for my first goal. I, I remember saying I wanted people to better say, oh, I watched Nick Feldo play. And I think I get that. You know, it's quite really nice when people come up to me and say, oh, I've made this big effort to go to a tournament and we're especially open. I've got great stories when somebody says, you know, I, you know, I got on the train and went up to Muirfield and watched you win and then come back, sit down and probably had a scotch and go, that was the best day of my life. And I think, wow, pretty cool. The real impact he's had is in 1996, in the year that he was winning his last major, the Masters, he created the Faldo series, all geared towards junior players around the world. And now, more than 25 years later, it's the preeminent junior golf tour in the world. 96, I'm Masters champion, and they're saying, where's the next Nick Felder? And we thought, okay, we've got to do something about this. And there was not enough opportunities to play tournament golf in Britain. So we created events there. And bottom line, that expanded from Britain to, to Europe. We took that formula to Asia, and then across to America. So we now have 60 plus events in 40 plus countries, and we have grand finals. And then now we're gonna be able to create more opportunities for the kids to play in challenge tour events, 
and professional tour events. So that is a huge bonus because that's something I never did and that's, I wouldn't say it's a word regret, I, I just missed out on that. I'd love to be an amateur and go and test myself to see how good I really was. So we're expanding all the time, which is great. I've had my Faldo design business since 2000. I did some bits before, but I've had my own team. Me, I'm the designer, strategy, um, you know, the vision, and I have architects who make, put this down. And Cambodia and Pakistan are very good examples of where or how we like to be inspired by the environment, what's there, what's the tradition, what's the heritage of that country, what's the architecture. We love all that. Uh, he's a workaholic. The guy obviously uh, is, is uh, dedicated to, to whatever he's involved in. And I, and I think I can see this with, with Black Bull and Duncan Taylor Scotch Whiskey. We are a pretty young team at, at Duncan Taylor. I'm, pro I'm exactly the same age as Sir Nick, so uh, we, we can think together on how things should be developed and, uh, and, and train up a young team to, uh, to, to build this brand up worldwide. So he's a perfect fit. I couldn't think of any better. If you really want to know how hard it is to achieve what players like him do, look at him. That's it. That's, that's, it doesn't happen any other way. That part's sad. Um, the level they achieve isn't sad. To push limits in a sport, to do things that nobody else does, that should be in mind. I always look at uh, my life in kind of five-year chunks, and I've got great stuff with business. I've got a great girl in Lindsay. We've got a great plan in our own personal life in, up in Montana. We're pretty happy. Yeah, I am. I'm a happy chappy. I'm all right. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt that his legacy on and off the, the golf course means a lot to us. And Jack has a tournament in the U.S., as does Arnie. Um, should Sir Nick Faldo have a tournament here at the DP World Tour? Personally, I think he should. Will he? Let's just watch that space. <laughs>